Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you. It's almost an in conversation with. It's more of a colloquial chat about practice and what we think makes up effective practice. And joining me tonight is our bass trombonist, Adam Dutch. Both of us have, have studied music performance and, and uh, obviously had to put a fair amount of practice in in our time. Um, and, you know, I'm going to talk about the way the way sort of practice changes over time as well. Uh, and we're just going to discuss really what what we've found effective, what what we think makes effective practice, what might be useful to you. You might come away with some some ideas about the way you practice. Um, you might have some thoughts about what we're sort of presenting to you. And I've also got a couple of little videos to show you, which you may or may not have seen before, but uh, hopefully they'll be, be new to you. Adam and I have had a quick chat and I think they're both going to be new to him, uh, but it'll be interesting to to see, um, see some other people's ideas on practice. And a lot of people, particularly without um, a goal and during lockdown, you know, a lot of people have been struggling with practice, I think, finding the motivation to do it. Um, and sort of going from there. So uh, quite a timely uh, time, if that's a, if that's a phrase, uh, to talk about practice as, as the restrictions look like they're being eased and we may well be able to return to small scale and then eventually large scale rehearsals again. It may be time to get the instrument out if you've not been doing as much as possible uh, and, and start to rebuild that stamina up um yeah i agree malcolm june the 22nd looks like you know good and of course you know if we could have the rule of six outside but hopefully um we'll be able to start playing in small groups outdoors and things like that we'll, we'll keep an eye on all the information that comes out and feed that back to you but if it's not been out the box for a long time and you've stuck your instrument underneath the bed and maybe just done the virtual performances with us and things this might help you get back into playing too now um, when I lecture in music performance, I do a whole series of, of lectures about um, effective practice. And one of the main points I try and get across to my students is the fact that one should never go into the practice room without a plan. You shouldn't know what you want to achieve through that practice. You don't necessarily need to practice uh, a huge amount of time for it to actually be very effective. But you've got to know what you want to practice and you've got to you've got to sort of have a plan before you you go into the practice room. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I want to bring Adam in and sort of say, do you do you a agree with the plan to practice and and sort of thinking about timings? You know, I don't think you need to practice for hours and hours every day if the practice you're doing is effective. No, absolutely not. I think I agree totally with the, um, you know, the idea of going in with a plan. I think as well, a really good, a really good way to practice effectively is to have a routine that you do at the start and end of every lesson. So a warm up and a warm down, because when we approach our instruments, we are essentially like athletes. We're using musculature and that needs to be warmed up and warmed down effectively. And that's also a really good way to develop our endurance on our instrument and also our tone quality and our projection and our sound quality. And we can do that through really simple exercises rather than just attacking the notes on the page. I think the other thing as well, um, and one of my brass teachers in university told me this, um, he's like, in no situation will you ever play your instrument for more than 15 minutes straight. And what he meant by that is there's no time where you'll ever have your instrument constantly on your lips for 15 minutes at some point in that 15 minutes you'll you'll take it off your face and you'll stop playing and, and or whatever there'll be a break so if you've got the endurance um to be able to play for that 15 minutes well and effectively that's that's far more important than being able to you know practicing for hours and you hear like string players are particularly guilty of it oh i've been practicing for 27 hours today and it's like well that, that's great you, you need to be able to do that short bit effectively. Yeah, how, how much of the 27 hours was actually effective practice and how much was that just playing? And is that actually doing you any good at all? Um, you know, I agree with the, the warm-up thing, obviously, when we're in band rehearsals. What I like to do when, when I'm practicing, and I encourage my students to do the same, is I create with them, and I have my own toolbox, as I call it, of warm-ups, you know? 
and I will always try and do something relevant to something I'm working on or something the students are working on. We will warm up with that. Now, there's two reasons for this. One is that if you're practicing your instrument every day, which ideally you should be, um, you want to avoid the monotony of practice because let's face it, to become better at something, you have to do the same thing correctly over and over again and that can become quite monotonous so you want to develop a set of warm-ups um, ideally with your teacher if you've got one um, that actually develop the aspect aspects of playing that you're looking to develop within the plan of your practice you know so for instance at the moment i'm working on um, lots of diminished patterns for jazz improvisation so i'm warming up with various kinds of diminished patterns and working them into minor triads and i have a very sort of set way of of using that to work on, as Adams mentioned, stamina, tone, projection, quality of sound, sound development. But I'm doing those exercises and I've got a set of four or five of them and I don't do them all every day. I do one each day. So I've got, you know, kind of a week's worth of warm up activities to do that will then lead me into the main body of my practice. If all you do is play the same scale or there's your cat yes. <laughs> the same scale or the same long notes or the same little tune that you always play when you warm up and um, you're going to get quite sick of it and quite bored of it and is it effective well no because you're kind of just doing the same thing over and over again um and with the idea of of having the the plan there's various various ways to to think about that perhaps you're working on an mwo piece of music um and you think okay that's what i want to attack in the main body of my my practice session i want to i want to sort out this this piece of, of music that we're playing in band well i'd be looking at what key is it in i'd be playing the scale and the arpeggio of that piece to warm up to think about what what's uh, what is relevant to the piece of music that i'm going to play what is going to work those things that I want to work that that matches up with the piece that I'm I'm going to play as well, and just just like Adam was saying, you know, 27 hours a day, not not possible even in a day. Um, I see what I did there with the maths. Um, I I would suggest that small amounts of practice regularly um, has a greater effect than a large amount of practice. You know, um, if you're thinking about doing 20 minutes each day, if it's 20 minutes of very effective practice, that's much better for you than actually four hours of just playing. Um, when I was at university, I was practicing four hours every day, two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon without fail. Um, and I actually probably practice much more effectively now than I did then. Um, although I don't spend that long doing it throughout a day, I might get an hour's worth of practicing, but I break it up into kind of three 20 minute sections in between teaching and, and all the other things I do. Um, so it kind of, kind of work it into, into the, the day like that. Um, yeah, I think it's effect like effective practice. One of the things I, so you were saying you've been working on on diminished scales. I've been working on range on my little trombone, counterintuitively by playing low, um, to then you know build build my register upwards. Um, but I quite like the idea of of I leave my one of my trombones out or I try and leave one of my trombones out. And if there's something that I'm really struggling with to play, I, I'll walk by my trombone every now and then. I'll pick my trombone up and I'll just try and play that bar. And I'll, I'll just do it like once or twice and then I'll put it down and, and walk away from it. And just that kind of, because some, and, and I think we're going to talk about it when we talk a little bit about cognitive load, um, you know, late, later on. Um, if, if you try and hammer stuff over and over and over and over and over again for, for like hours on end, it's, you will reach a point where it's not going to go in. Whereas if you do, one of the mantras I say whenever I'm teaching performance to my students is little and often, you know, practice the bits that you can't play, do them break them down as small as you can do them as often as you can as slowly as you can because it's all it's all muscle memory isn't it and, and it's developing those skills to be able to then build it up to you know where where you want it to be but i don't think anybody would espouse the the idea of kind of that i'm going to practice every hour in the day because it, it's not effective 
Um, I think I think you you're right about the the break it down into the little bits you can't do. You know, you should think, well, I've got a piece and I don't want to just play it from top to bottom. I want to find the bits I can't do and practice them. And we'll talk about some some ideas about how to practice those in a minute. Um, and we're getting very close to watching the first video as we get into the cognitive side of things. But Adam, you mentioned uh, muscle memory there. Um, now, I've got a real bee in my bonnet about the fact that muscle memory doesn't exist. So okay. we, we could well fall out publicly in front of <laughs> MWO here. Um, I think what happens, and it's my belief that, that A, muscles don't have memory. Your fingers don't just remember where to go. There's got to be some kind of electrical impulse uh, through the motor neurological connection in your brain which shoots super quickly down into the muscles and tells the muscles where to go and what to do. And if you do this um, regularly enough in the correct way, repetitively, um, the motor neurological connection in your brain is created. And then the repetition insulates that motor neurological connection with a substance called myelin. And the more you do something correctly, the more myelin sheath builds around the motor neurological connection, like the insulation on an electrical cable, and it keeps that signal being extremely strong. Or yeah. another, another analogy is like a drain pipe that is really, really clear and the water just rushes through it. But then if you stop doing something for a while, the myelin breaks down or the drain pipe clogs up a bit so the water doesn't flow through the electrical signal doesn't flow, flow through quite as well. And the example I always use is, remember when you had the long, hazy summer holidays when you were a kid and you went back into, um, into school and you thought, I can't remember how to write. And it just feels a bit rusty, doesn't it? It's, it's this idea, and, and it's really popular in, in education currently, of, of the idea of working memory and, and kind of... Sorry, short-term memory and working memory and when where i think of muscle memory that's when it's established within your working memory and you can just you can access it without consciously thinking i'm now playing an a flat and then i'm going to play a c and then i'm going to play a d flat. and and all of the 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 constituent parts that go with that as as you go because if we're learning a piece or if we're sight reading actually our brain's doing incredibly complex things very quickly you know it's it's there's thousands of processes going on all the time and by having those those processes embedded in your long term memory, you're taking it off that instantaneousness because it, it's the connections have already been been developed, um, which, which I think is really important. As you yeah. as you spoke about, Ooh, that's my heart. Lovely. <laughs> um, so I would, uh, yeah, I would agree with that. And I would, but the way I term it and the way I talk about it is it's moving from the conscious to the subconscious. Yeah. So you you are still thinking about it. It's just not right at the front at the conscious part of your of your brain. And it's, you know, if you think about driving your car when you first start to drive, if you're right, I'm in first gear, I'm accelerating, clutch down, I've got to go into second, right? I'm in second gear, I'm in second gear. What do I go to next? Third gear. And of course, once you've done that a lot, you don't think about that. But when you buy a new car and everything feels slightly different, you start to think about it again. It moves more from the subconscious yeah. into the conscious. Um, do you but want to do I, questions now, or do you want to leave until after? The uh, I think I'd like to watch this little video because well, Carl is saying we that we've watched the TED Education Talk on how to practice. Well, I have definitely, and I encourage all my students to. Adam thinks he might have done in the mists of time, but I'm going to share my screen now, and we're going to watch it together. It's only a couple of minutes long, but it's absolutely talking about this cognitive process that goes on with learning to do just about anything effectively. And I have the conversation so often with students about actually practicing in a cognitive manner Think about what you're playing. What note are you on? What finger is doing that? What note do you want to go to next? How do you do that? And actually, the more we think, the more correctly we play. And it's when we just hope the instrument will do it itself and rely more on our ears and 
I don't know, magic, you know, yeah. and just hope it happens that things go wrong. When we actually really, really engage our brain and think very carefully about it, it works. That might mean doing things slightly slower, you know, and really having that cognitive process going on. And uh, yeah, so I think now is a good time to uh, have a little look at this. So I'm just going to share my screen with everybody. So there we go. But you can see what I mean about the idea that I'm coming from, from that kind of um, repetitive building up of the motor neurological connections. And what really got me interested in that was um, a study I read about putting a jazz musician in an MRI scanner, probably the best place to leave a jazz musician. <laughs> but the, the improvising jazz musician's brain lights up like there's fireworks going on when, when we're improvising because there's so much cognitive uh, process happening in real time as we're playing. And if you've ever had a lesson with me or um, I can't remember if I've stated it in my Fun With Scales videos that have gone around the band, um, I always say, if you can say it, you can play it. There they're talking about you don't actually need to do uh, anything with your instrument. You can practice a lot just by thinking things through. You know, I, I'll often sort of talk myself through patterns and say the notes of a scale up and down and see if I can say them. Sorry, Adam, you're just... I was just going to say, I remembered where I've seen that video now, that, that TED Talk. So uh, there's an American jazz musician and educator called Adam Neely who's done two videos that are really pertinent to this. One of them is he learns, he's an American jazz bass player, and he learns a Bach cello sonata on a train by playing on his arm. Yeah. Um, and he frets the whole thing on his arm. And by the time he gets home after this three hour train journey, he then sits down and plays it on his bass. But also, um, the thing you were talking about, the study, uh, he took part in that study and he's done, right. a, he's done a video where he actually he is being MRI'd while he's playing. And yeah. yet, it's, it's fascinating the kind of what's going on mentally you know, during that process. And, uh, you know, I'll I'll link both those videos in the in the chat in a second because I think they're both, they're probably 15 minutes each, so they've obviously not got time to watch them now. But for anybody who's interested in that kind of, you know, how we can develop cognitively and, and you know, musical learning in that way, I do really, really recommend watching them. One of the interesting points they, they, they picked up on that TED Talk was the fact that um, rep repetition is key. Uh, and now it absolutely is, but it's got to be correct repetition. Uh, and another another sort of Phil Schott and Bingo phrase that I always use is practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent. Yeah. If you practice something incorrectly over and over and over again, you learn it incorrectly. And re really interested. So I was playing my trombone earlier today and I played a piece that I played in my final recital in university that I've probably not played since I played in my final recital in university. And I was playing it this afternoon and I got halfway down the first page and realised that there was a rhythm that I'd played wrong, that I will have played wrong in my recital, that I'd just learned wrong. But because I'd, I'd basically forgotten the piece and I was essentially relearning it, I was like, but my oral memory of it, the way I had heard myself play it, didn't match up with what I did. And I'd stop and look and went, no, what I've just played then is right. And it's exactly that. I'd learned a mistake. And yeah. I say this to students all the time. If you learn a mistake, it's incredibly difficult to unlearn it. That's why it's really important to practice things correctly. And that's why I always think it's a really good idea to practice things incredibly slowly. Get them, get them right at half the tempo even less but get it accurate and then build up the speed because once you've got that accuracy there you're then the repetition is enforcing that correctness yeah and and what what the slow tempo does is it builds up that motor neurological connection because it gives it time it gives your brain time to process all that information and actually create something you are actually having a physiological change in your brain as you're learning to do something that's new um another thing that was picked up on that video was that that um People who practice the most effectively are always just on the cusp of what they're able to do. Uh, and I wanted to pick up on that point because uh, some of my students say to me, my practice doesn't sound very good. And I say, great, that's exactly what you want it to sound like. If you sound brilliant in the practice room all the time, you are not practicing 
you are playing Play stuff you can already play you know um it's no, it's a real oh sorry i was going to say no, it's, no, a real, no. it's a real kind of you you want you want to and we're all guilty of it i know i'm guilty of it of you know, you you like when you sound good. So the temptation there is, you know, you've got three pages of music. You can play two of them spot on. The third one's an absolute dog. So you play the first page, you get two bars into the second page and go, I'll, I'll pick that one up later and I'll go to the end. Where And that's that's not practicing. You're just playing the bits that you can play. And I think playing is also exceedingly important. Definitely. But it's just making the, the differentiation between the practice or what I'd sometimes call the woodshedding, uh, and then the enjoyable playing part. So always when I'm, you know, every day when I'm playing and teaching and practicing, I always have some point in the day where I have 20 minutes of just playing stuff I enjoy. And I'll usually leave that to the end. You know, I'll get all the hard stuff done first. But at the end of your practice session, always play something you really enjoy playing. You should never leave your practice on that bit where you've gone, oh, I worked really hard on that today and it's only got a little bit better. Anyway, I'll do the same tomorrow. You know, because that's a terrible way to put your instrument away in the case. You want to end on a high, play something you really love, you really enjoy, nice and easy. You can be as, as expressive as you like and you can have a bit of fun and just remind yourself why you're learning to play a musical instrument in the first place. Uh, and it's okay if you know you do your little bit of warming up as we talked about before you have your main body of practice what do i actually want to achieve from today i want to get those eight bars correct from this sonata or i want to you know learn the chord changes to all the things you are or i want to get one phrase from an mwo piece sorted you get that done and then you can play for a bit and just enjoy playing you'll probably find that you end up playing for longer because you're really enjoying yourself think as well we've got to remember that practice isn't an isolated act so if you practice one thing for one piece that's going to improve facets and this kind of it, I, was, I was just reading julian's question about kind of starting a piece and then and then practicing another piece and starting a piece and practicing another piece and not really not really finishing any, anything and not really finishing a piece um i think what one thing i think is really helpful is you, you're going to come across a lot of techniques in piece a that are useful in piece B and piece C. So by finishing piece A and really, you know, really working on it and really kind of getting into the nitty gritty of it, you'll probably find when you finish that and you come to look at piece B that was only half finished, you're then better because you spent that time working on that first piece. And, the, you know, the temptation is always when you, you get to something that's at the edge of your technical ability to go, oh, I'll, I'll look at something else. But actually, if you, if you can develop that, it's going to improve you're playing holistically, not just that one little one piece. Particularly if you can make the connections between the two pieces as well and think, oh, this is like this yeah. other piece I played, or this phrase feels like that, or this this musical pattern, this is an arpeggio, and I had these in that piece. And making those connections and links between pieces is very, very important as well. I think um, as well, I was just going to say, dead quickly on that, annotating your music as well. We talk about it in rehearsals all the time, but annotate your pieces at home. You know, like I... I Sometimes if I'm playing something that's like quite tricky and, and it's, I might write, oh, that's a D flat major seven arpeggio and, and literally just write D flat major seven arp over the top of it. And then I'm like, okay, I know what that is kind of without, you know, looking at it too too much and kind of, and, and circle things. If I pick up a piece of music, if I'm depping in a show or playing for an orchestra or whatever, if I pick up a piece of music that's got no pencil on it, I'm going to assume that it's, dead easy and I can probably sight read it. If I pick up a piece of music that's full of annotations, I instantly go, right, what in this is hard? Where where am I? But that for me is a mark of a good musician because they're they're helping themselves out. They're kind of yeah. giving themselves clues. I encourage my students to go pattern spotting and we look out for arpeggios of various types and I'll actually get them to write chord symbols over the top just yeah. like you know a, a jazz or commercial musician would have uh, and that's even in things like the mozart clarinet concerto you know which diminished seventh pattern is this right okay now you know what that pattern is you don't need to engage as much. nothing is so much of a shock to you then is it you know you're not reading one note at a time you're looking at a, a bigger bit um so let's let's talk for a moment about that bit in the middle of your practice where you're really working hard 
on a phrase. And Adam, you mentioned, you know, keep a trombone out. And every time you walk past the trombone, go, oh, yeah, it's getting better. Great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you walk past it, go, oh, yeah, superb. Because uh, all trombonists play like Douglas that, from the. That is all we did. Advert. Um, <laughs> now, I'm the same. I have instruments out and, and I can pick them up. And at the end of the day, I take the reeds off to add the mouthpieces out and then they're ready to go for the next day. Being predominantly wind band musicians here, our instruments aren't actually as accessible as we'd like them to be because they tend to live in a case. Uh, so I think it is a good idea to leave them out if you've got somewhere safe to leave them out where the dog isn't going to pick up your clarinet and run off with it or something. Um, you know, and do it's unlike the guitar or the piano or drums where you can just sit down and, and play. You know, you've got it. It sounds so silly, but actually just taking it out of the case can be a bit of a barrier to practice, can't it? Where if it's just there in the corner, you can pick it up and you can have a go. Uh, so that's important. But I wonder, I mean, I've got I've got a few ideas about how I would attack a phrase if I can't play it. I'm just wondering what your, your pearls of wisdom are. If somebody's got a little four bar phrase that they're struggling to play, what what um, what practice techniques have you got that you could share with us, mate? Yeah, so um, I mean, I, I've, a few of them I've mentioned already. So if I'm really struggling to play something, I'm gonna I'm gonna slow it right down first. Um, depending on what the piece is, sometimes and if it's a solo, I might listen to it, but I tend to not listen. If I'm practicing like a, a concerto or something like that, I try not to listen to the piece because I want to go in with my own musical idea of kind of of what that sounds like. If I'm playing a band piece or if I'm playing in a pit orchestra, I might listen to the piece to kind of get an idea and a feel but we know from playing in wind bands if you're playing a third clarinet part your part might be buried under lots of other things so it's kind of it can be hard to sometimes pick out one of the things i used to do which admittedly isn't accessible to everybody i used to write a lot of parts out in sibelius and i'd listen back to just that one part individually to check that i was i was getting it right and to check that i was i was playing it accurately um, and I'm a big subscriber as well, and Phil's far harsher than me. I'm three times right, so if you're playing a phrase or something like that, you've got to play it three times right in a row before you're allowed to leave it. And I, I do five times, yeah, yeah five times perfectly yes. um, in a row, and then, then you can have a go. And I just, uh, you know, you mentioned the slow things right now. I'm a huge fan of the tempo it should be, absolute half speed yeah, absolute half speed and then the tempo it should be again so i can't play it that fast half speed i can play it it's painfully slow but i yeah. can play it full speed still can't play it okay half speed yeah. and, and I'm, i don't really buy into the the incremental gradually getting a bit faster a bit faster a bit faster yeah. i think the full tempo to half speed what it does is it gives the brain a time to process the music you're trying to play very slowly and then you've got that mathematical connection it actually yeah. makes logical sense it's contextually defined to go from half the speed you've been playing back up to double speed back down to half speed there's, there's two other things that i i would say there as well firstly practice with a metronome mm -hmm. absolutely practice with a metronome secondly and this was a, a a technique that i learned from a brass band conductor what he actually did was um he practiced everything up until when we were rehearsing for a contest, he practiced everything up until about two weeks before the contest, about seven or eight BPM too fast. Um, and then when it got to two weeks before the contest, he's like, right, now we're going to play at the real speed. Um, and so it, it might be worth, if you've got a phrase that you're really struggling with, speed almost speed it up a little bit faster than you think you're going to play it and then half the speed so the half speed is going to be it's still going to be painfully slow but it's going to be a little slower than real half speed and then when you double that it's going to be faster than you actually need to play it and then when you need to play it in real time it's like oh this is loads of, i don't know why i was a clarinet then but oh this is loads easier than you know than it was when it was faster yeah, uh, I think that shows a deep desire for you to actually join the Woodwind family, mate. <laughs> that. Um, yeah, I'd agree. If you practice um, to the extremes, you know, if you practice faster than it needs to go and you can play it faster than it needs to go, you can stand out on stage and you play at the real tempo. It is, it takes the edge off it. It's no longer at the cusp of what you're able to do. It's, yeah. It feels more comfortable and it feels more laid back. Relaxed. I was going to say, there's one other thing as well that I think is, and I think it's really important to talk about now, and it comes down to the way that rhythm is taught 
in our country. We there's a horrible tendency, and I see this in kids all the time. They think of semiquavers as being fast notes, and they're not. Semiquavers are. I, my trombone teacher murdered me for this when I was in secondary school. Was, and he gave me a Haydn cello concerto, and there's a slow movement. And I remember picking it up and seeing demi semiquavers and all. And so I just start trying to leather through this piece. It's like, Adam, have you have you looked at what the tempo is? And it was like quaver equals forty. So it's painfully, painfully slow. So don't just think when you see semiquavers or demi semiquavers, don't think of them as, as fast notes. They're divisions of a bar. So I always think if I've got something like that, I'll mark where the beats are so I can see, right, that's where beat one is, that's where beat two is. And then before I play it, I'm going to just set my metronome up and I'm going to read it and I'm going to go, right, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, for example. And that's like, right, that's where that's going. And it then becomes it all becomes more rhythmically defined rather than just I'm playing really fast. Yeah. I think that's a really common misconception. I see it in students all the time as well. You know, um, it's, it all relates down to the pulse and the subdivision of the, the pulse, whatever that is. Um, yeah. And I agree. People see semiquavers and they think they just assume it should be fast. It's a real problem for people when they're learning to sight read, you know, and it boils down to to the simple matter of fact you've got to relate everything to the pulse pop your metronome on you know and and be aware put the beat lines in see things in beat blocks see things vertically as well as horizontally as the, the melody might flow that yeah that's incredibly important um i've got a couple of, of little top tips for those phrases that are, you're struggling with one of them i really like to do um, and I do with my students is play the phrase from the last note. So you play the last note of the phrase. Mm -hmm. So you go, bop. I go, okay, I can play the last note. Great. Then you go one note back. Bop, bop. Oh, cool. Play the last two notes. Then you can go back the third note. I can't remember what that was in the phrase. <laughs> you, but bid up, bop. Okay, that's good. Then you go another note back. Da, da, do, da, da, da. Yeah. Brilliant. So you're working from the right hand side of the bar to the left, the opposite way, but always traveling in the direction that we'd usually go left to right. Um, so reading it in a way, but working one note back each time through the phrase, which means you're always going to material you can already play, which has a massive bonus to you. Because otherwise, you're always going to material you can't play. So you're kind of banging your head against a brick wall all the time. Ba -ba -di oh, I can't play. Ba -ba -di oh, no. Ba -ba -di -ba oh, no. Ba -ba -di -ba oh, no. You know, and that is a terribly soul destroying way to practice. Whereas if you work backwards, you only get one note you haven't played yet correctly to tackle. You know, and it takes a long time, but it is well worth it. It really does pay dividends. Uh, so that's one of my favorites, that kind of backwards practice. And the other thing I really like is the forwards and backwards. So play the phrase forwards, the whole phrase, and then play the phrase literally backwards, not one note at a time, but from right to left. OK, yeah. so you play the whole thing, all the pitches correctly, all the rhythms, but totally backwards. And what that does is it flips the brain around and the brain has to think, really really hard um and it makes you concentrate much more on what the note is it's a bit like what you were saying adam before about playing really faster than you need to go you make it miles harder and then when you come to play it the correct way around again your brain goes oh thank goodness for that and it feels miles easier okay so that's a that's a really nice little tip yeah. the five times thing you've mentioned your vague yeah, you're very lenient. going on your students, yeah, clearly. Yeah, obviously. Uh, yeah I, I like a five times game. And, you know, I even play that myself. I, yeah. I'm going to say I'm going to do that five times perfectly. And you get to number four, <laughs> yeah, you're, and then really you're like, focused, and then you cock it up, and, and it all falls to bits. And you go, right, okay, here we I, go, number one again, you know. I think it's important, to, it's important to mention, though, I know for me, this is still things that I use in my daily practice. Oh, absolutely, I still, yeah. I yeah. still use... I'm going to play it three times. I'm going to slow it right down. I'm going to play to a metronome. I'm going to mark the beats on. You know, it, it, this is not just kind of things that you should do when if you're, you know, just starting out. This is it, this is good practice to, to be in, you know, and it'll make everything you do easier. 
yeah, at whatever level of the game exactly. or however far down the, the road you are with your, your musical journey, it's effective practice starts from the first time you pick up your instrument to, That's you know, all, 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 all through your life, you know, yeah. uh, absolutely. Um, I'm also a fan of, of a looping practice. Yeah, you know, in time with the metronome. Yeah, I'll do it again. Yeah, you know we play that game in band occasionally. It's yeah. uh, that's that's good. Um, so they're they're sort of little tips and and hints that I use and, and obviously you use in your practice and we share with our our, our students as well. Um, one of the, the questions I get asked a lot about is monitoring practice and how you monitor it and how you keep a record of it. Um, yeah, that's what the one of the best things is to record yourself. Um, I, I know a lot of people don't like doing that, but it really, really helps. If you play, if you're practicing the same piece and you want to see how you're progressing or you want to hear back, see if you can spot anything you're doing wrong. You record that each time you are practicing and, you know, you'll be able to hear a big change from recording number one to recording number seven. So at the end of your hard bit of woodshedding practice, before you're moving into the play, just stick your phone on, record yourself. You can listen back. You can say, oh, that's getting better. Or, oh, no, I need to work on that next time. I'll look out for that. And after the end of the week, you end up with a nice set of recordings. And if you jump from number one to number seven, you'll hear a massive improvement. I mean, it's it's quite significant if you're practicing in that way. And it's so handy because everybody's got their, their sort of phone there. It's, it, you know, just be aware it's not recording studio quality, but it's just a tool for monitoring, which is well, good. One thing I heard the other day, which I've not tried yet, is actually on if you're on your phone, if you and I don't know how to do this, I have to look, if you turn your gain down on your audio recorder, so if you turn your gain down to about half, yeah. The recording will be quieter, so you'll have to turn the volume up when you listen back to it, but it's it's not going to peak as much, so it's going to yeah. be more. I think as well, the good thing about recording is it's not like if you play into a friend and they might be subjective. A recording is clinical. If you play a wrong note, you're going to hear that wrong note. If you and, and it goes two ways. I've recorded stuff before where I've gone, well, that was absolutely terrible. And then you listen back to it and you kind of go, oh, that actually wasn't that bad. And that mistake that I thought was horrendous in the context of what is going on you can't really hear so no i think i i would advocate record as absolutely as much as you can i i do it every day i record the things i'm playing and uh, if i'm particularly proud of it, it goes on social media uh, the majority of it just gets deleted at the end of a week and i start all over again um i was practicing today i've got a recording project to do uh, and I thought, right, I want to see how I sound when I sight read through this piece. So uh, I did it and I recorded it and I've listened back. And it's clear to me I need to do a bit more work on it. But through listening to the recording and hearing myself play, I was aware, you know, it confirmed to me the bits I need to have a look at and really, really sort of tidy up on. Um, the other thing I, I like and I, you know, all my students have, a notebook for their lessons and we always write down what we've done in the lesson what they need to go away and think about what their effective practice part needs to look like what sort of things they're looking at but also you know it can be good to have a practice diary and each time you you uh, are practicing it's a good way to see what you did yesterday um, I'm literally talking a few bullet points. You know, what was my warm up for my toolbox of warm ups? What was my main body of practice? How did I do it? What pieces did I play afterwards? So the next day you come up and you go, oh, I did that yesterday. So I'll not do that warm up. I'll do that other one. And then I'll do this. That seems to be getting better. So now I'll do that. And it helps you plan. Maybe you can plan uh, beforehand. You can, you know, first thing in the morning, you can sort of say, right, what am I planning to practice on today? That's what I did yesterday. Today I'll do this, that, and the other, you know, and literally it only takes a few seconds, just a little, little notebook of bullet points. I think as well, it's it's something we've not really touched upon very much, but um, practicing sight reading is a really, really effective tool. So I've, I've got loads of books of studies. And I know when I was at university, when I used to go and practice, I'd pick up a book and I'd just, I, I wouldn't necessarily plan it. I'd just open to a page look for a study I've not played. It's like, right, that's my sight reading for, for today. Um, and, you know, a, a, approach it in a different way that you might maybe approach the, like the practice of, of a piece that you're prefer, preparing for 
rehearsal, the practice of the sight reading is how effectively can I play this in real time? And there are going to be mistakes and there are going to be, you know, and you might have to restart something and whatever, but, but do practice that actual sight reading part as well. Very, very important. And I know that a few of uh, few of my students who play of MWO have been checking out the Hal Leonard scores, which I'm sure Adam's going to talk to you about just for, for a moment. Um, I use the Hal Leonard scores sometimes as score study. So because you can follow the whole score and you can hear it being played. Um, I've got students who are picking out their part, you know, second clarinet, second flute, whatever. Uh, within the score and just putting a different Hal Leonard play along on on YouTube um, and then and then just playing along with it and each day doing a different selection from a different show or a different piece of music and it kind of feels a bit like being in band because yeah. it's playing along kind of like we do in the virtual rehearsals. Um, do you want to expand on that? I'll just just very more? briefly, I'll just see if I can see if I can share this with. Oh yeah, there we go. So just in case you're not aware of it, so. Uh, YouTube Hal Leonard Concert Band channel. Um, and what's really, really good about these, now they're not necessarily going to be, you know, to a, a point where you're able to kind of um, read your part, though if you've got particularly good eyes, you might be able to. Studio recordings of the Hal Leonard pieces, and they, they're broken down, if I go back, um, they're broken down by various things, so Flexi Band, Boozy and Hawks, Popular Uploads, Grade Level, okay? The other thing as well is I would say, so, you know, we've got, a, we've all got a pad full of music, you know, at home. So if you're thinking I've got, I've not really got anything to, to sight read or I've not got anything to practice away from the stuff that we're getting back in track sent out for. We've got Incantation and Dance in the pad, Incantation and Dance, John Barnes Chance. So there we go, Hal and Concert Band. So, and it might not necessarily be the same tempi that we take it with band, but it's the opportunity to play your part along with something else. And I think while we're unable to do that in real time with real people, being able to do it like that is an, a really effective practice technique. And there's a massive, massive repository of recorded music available for free on YouTube just at the end of a search. And you've got a, a big repository of, of music within your pad. So if you find something that you know and it might be um i don't know uh orient express for example You're like i hate orient, orient express it's dead hard i can't play it well after you've spent some time breaking it down and practicing it slowly and speeding it back up blah 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 blah. how about we do it along with a recording so i think there's there's a real wealth of kind of um you know stuff to be used there and i just wanted to particularly that um the hal leonard concert band channel i just wanted to make people aware of the fact that that existed and you know the fact that it is you know it's not a high school band in you know population four milwaukee or anything like that you know they are they are good quality kind of professional bands that are making these recordings so yeah and that by the way was what i was mentioning before which we'll we'll send out so that's adam nearly practicing his instrument with his forearm and that's how your brain practices harmony so again about 11 10 minutes each but really really interesting and play sober apparently as a <laughs> tip who knew not, not for brass players not for brass players no. never <laughs> yeah that's excellent and you know you can you can you can use that hal Leonard resource to, to play along most of the stuff that's in our pads will be available if not on the hal leonard channel there'll be other um scores and if you want to follow the score the pages all turn automatically yeah. which is really good fun and some of them even have a cursor so if you're if you're learning how to read scores you you won't get lost uh, as much which is which is excellent um I've re we, adam and i could probably talk for another oh i don't know two or three weeks yeah, about yeah. this <laughs> um but we're, we're coming to the end of this evening's session to finish the evening we're going to have a, a little look at a video um by a saxophonist called wally wallace dr wally wallace uh, who is is one of my heroes um and he's talking about his ideas behind effective practice it's only about two minutes long it pretty much covers uh, what adam and i have said and it goes with apologies to anybody who is an Apple iWatch wearer, which I know Adam is, so I am, yeah. I am apologizing in advance. Yeah. You will see why. So I shall share my screen, we'll watch this, and then uh, we'll be back on just to finish the session.
That was Dr. Wally Wallace of the Saxophone Academy, kind of summing up everything we've we've already talked about, but in quite a humorous manner. And he does some very, very good podcasts. Uh, and there's all kinds of YouTube videos from him as well. He's definitely somebody else worth uh, worth checking out. It's uh, it's quite quite interesting. Um, so uh, yeah, just a nice little fun one to to finish us off with. Uh, Carla says it's the truth we can't stand. Does that mean the in terms of the recording never lies? Uh, quite... Or is she referring to my expensive Apple Watch? Uh, possibly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I love that. I I love there his go, line. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love his line. Um, what was it? Um, Thirty years ago, the most exciting thing in the practice room was the metronome. You know, and <laughs> and it's true. And I think we're all guilty of it. I use my tablet a lot for for reading sheet music. But if I don't put it on aeroplane mode, you know, I'm hearing emails come through and texts and, and the temptation to look at that. In fact, I was even playing uh, some solo transcriptions along with records today. And when it wasn't the saxophone solo, there was a 64 bar piano solo. And I found myself busy replying to a text message in the middle. And I shouldn't. I should have been totally engaged in what I'm doing. So, yeah, try and re remove the remove the distractions. Focus in. Little and often, uh, I think that would. As, as an interesting one, Bill, what's what's Andante on the metronome? I'm going to say crotchet equals seventy-two. Um, Andante, yeah, I would go. I would maybe gone a bit faster and gone to eighty. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'd have to. I'd have to grab a, 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 a an old-fashioned metronome to to find out. Uh, yeah, it should it should say it should say on a on an old metronome or a quick Google search. But yeah, between seventy two and eighty four, I think would be a, a fair a fair andante, wouldn't it? Um, so there we go for this evening. Thanks very much to Adam. Cheers for joining me. Um, we look forward to the quiz when the will be around on effective practice techniques. I hope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so thanks everybody for, for joining us thanks for, to Chris for working behind the scenes and doing the technical stuff and uh, if you are over 18 and you wish to you can stay on this uh, chat here for the pub and we can we can have a nice a nice little bit of a social life but until then stay safe look after each other and we'll catch up with you next Tuesday bye bye bye